Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the organizers for putting this workshop together. It's really wonderful. I couldn't attend all talks, but uh, some, and uh, it was really great. Uh, and I'm, uh, of course, honored, and it's a pleasure to be allowed to also present um, my view and uh, some of the work that was done in my lab um, related to this theme. Um, now, um, let me uh, go ahead by giving an intro um, which uh, recently appeared in, in Barron's. Uh, the, the free technologies foreseen to create trillion dollar markets in the not so far future. Um, and two and three actually touch on uh, what we are talking about here. Um, so quantum computing and um, it is on demand, and I think the connecting bridge might very well be machine learning. So um, uh, this is sort of an area I think is extremely exciting. Now, um, I'm coming myself from the materials uh, side, and um, when we use uh, uh, materials, uh, when we study materials, um, we uh, typically want to include the the, the nature, the quantum nature of the, the materials. Um, this uh, dictates many uh, important properties which are relevant to us. And it also is the right physics, uh, so to speak, for dealing with uh, atoms and, and electrons. So um, by, by construction, we, we, we are interested in this, uh, if you wish. And um, uh, so we, we um, use machine learning to accelerate this. And, so if you go on Wikipedia, you look for quantum machine learning, you, you will find this uh, silly two by two matrix. And so we would be in this corner here where we use uh, classical machine learning uh, to study quantum properties. Um, now, um, of course, there's a lot of uh, work going on and it's really exciting of, of using um, uh, quantum algorithms to uh, study classical phenomena. But I think uh, the really the most exciting uh, part would be uh, once we, we all do this QQ box. Um, I think there's a, a lot of promise there. Um, I also agree with uh, some of the things that were said before that we are not there yet. So um, I think uh, this is good news. Uh, there's a lot of work uh, that's left for, for us and, and many of the younger people. Um, now, why, why do I like to dub our kind of work uh, quantum machine learning? There's actually a, a long tradition in, in the atomistic simulation communities uh, calling uh, a chemical or, or yeah, even using mechanical equations of uh, quantum objects to call them quantum uh, chemistry. Right? Uh, another um, thing is, another example is classical Monte Carlo. Um, uh, when, when you do quantum Monte Carlo, you, you use classical Monte Carlo algorithms to study uh, quantum uh, properties. Or another example is quantum molecular dynamics. You're using classical um, equations of mono, uh, motion uh, in order to uh, sample phase space. And uh, while doing so, you, you get the forces uh, required um, from quantum calculations. So, um, in similar vein, uh, we want to use classical machine learning for, or, or that's what we have been doing, classical machine learning for um, studying quantum objects. Now, um, when, when we do that, um, uh, we, we enjoy the fact that uh, as theoreticians, we, we get to determine and, and to the system and we, we know about the parameters. Experimental, uh, experimentalist friend of mine, Sergei Kalini, uh, from uh, at a workshop at the University of Tokyo, he's at Oak Ridge. He um, uh, is jealous, he, he thinks we know everything. But this is actually something I'd, I'd like to stress. There's a long tradition in materials and chemistry of using also machine learning approaches and uh, statistical uh, approaches and what's known as quantitative structure property relationships or quantitative structure activity relationships. Um, and uh, these kind of informatics approaches, they basically deliberately um, ignore all the quantum knowledge we have or the quantum physics and, and matter. And they, they try to uh, really map um, uh, directly uh, properties of interest to um, some, some idea of 
what compounds uh, look like. And uh, so I, I'd also like to stress this difference, right? So, so we really uh, uh, like to stress and emphasize, emphasize uh, uh, the, the rooting of our methods in, in, in the right physics. Um, so this is manifested in the fact that um, for most applications, as uh, was also shown before um, by Frank Noe or, or Alex Tkachenko now or, and um, uh, Michele Ceyotti and Gawasani, we, we do have uh, rigorous causal relationships. And the, the matter is, is we don't have noisy data in some sense. We, we know really what should be the, um, the, uh, the equation that governs uh, the phenomena, the signals that we observe. Um, and it's not about, uh, it's usually not so much about discovering um, that relationship, but rather about um, sidestepping uh, the costly um, step of having to numerically solve it. And um, you might think that this is actually boring and, and technical, um, but um, uh, this work is driven by the motivation that um, this would be uh, tremendously useful if we could uh, alleviate and, and lessen the computational burden that comes along with uh, navigating uh, materials and molecular uh, compound spaces. Now, um, the reason, the main motivation for that is that really eventually we'd, we'd like to uh, do the inverse, solve the inverse problem for materials. So when Traditionally, uh, you would start out with some material and, and predict its properties very much an analogy to the experiment. Um, we uh, actually would like eventually to do the inverse, right? You, you'd like to predefine a set of desirable properties you'd like your material to have, and then um, the algorithm should spit out um, that material or a list of candidate materials that come closest in that property. And, and those materials and could be could find useful applications. And so um, this is a, a tough problem because the chemical space is la large. And there's no analytical solution. It's it's defined. It's very high dimensional. And uh, every time we we do the forward solution, it's already very expensive, uh, at least in general. Um, and so uh, many many famous people and materials and chemistry have been working on this, these are uh, important names in, in the theoretical sciences. And you can think about solving this problem simply uh, brute force by an iterative minimization problem, where um, you try to minimize the deviation from some target property um, uh, in your chemical space, right? So in the nuclei and, and coordinates, uh, Z and R. Um, now, this is sort of a perfect storm in, in what comes here together and uh, I'd like just to briefly um, explain why. And so in 2004 and 2017, there were some nature uh, comments or perspectives. Uh, so this was actually an entire issue in, in 2014, where the problem of chemical space just from the drug design perspective was uh, described. Um, uh, a number was floated here that there's 10 to the 60 organic molecules. Um, there are certainly many more molecules in general, um, and this estimate was a conservative uh, sort of lower bound uh, only involving medium-sized um, molecules. Nevertheless, it was uh, repeated then in 2017 in this piece, and here you see the, the, the sheer scale of uh, potential numbers of compounds. Um, so this is clearly more than atoms in the solar system, right? And, so it's, it's, uh, it's easy to understand where this comes from. It's a combinatorial explosion of, of uh, elements which you can draw from the periodic table and which you can arrange in, in various geometries in, in real space, right? Um, so then it, it should be clear that very rapidly with molecular size, this grows uh, very fast. So Alex already uh, showed this picture, which was um, uh, created by a grad student in my lab, uh, showing the constellation of uh, aspirin. And this picture sort of um, uh, is, is the culmination of, of how we would illustrate or how we would view uh, this relationship. So the, um, the crucial point, of course, is to realize that uh, different compounds are not independent of each other. Um, they're, they're the solution to the Schrodinger equation 
um, they, they all all the properties of a uh, Schrodinger's equation, right? And and so as you go from one compound to another, there should be relationships. There are correlations, uh, and so it, it should be it should constitute a meaningful uh, problem for for uh, interpolation um, throughout this compound space. And so this is what we are trying to illustrate here. You see the constellation of the aspirin molecule. Um, all hydrogen atoms have been omitted. And on every heavy atom, you see other uh, smaller molecules uh, sharing the same kind of atom type. Uh, so here, for instance, you have an oxygen. And so the argument is that there's some relationship among these molecules. And if, if we were able to properly understand these relationships, uh, we could exploit them and navigate the space much more rapidly. Um, so uh, here's uh, just a visual um, trajectory in, in VR uh, going through a thousand uh, small molecules, uh, which we believe to be relevant. I'll be coming back to that later. These are amine molecules, uh, so they constitute a small uh, dictionary of training molecules. Um, and this is sort of a flowchart how you could envision that um, starting out with a bunch of uh, initial compounds, you you would solve uh, in approximate ways a uh, shooting as equation for them, extract some relevant properties, uh, train a machine on them, and then explore other, um, uh, other regions in chemical space to identify new candidates. And you do this in a loop, eventually you'll, you'll converge towards um, some set of uh, interesting compounds. So, so this is the, the general idea and the, the framework around. Now, um, in terms of quantum mechanics, uh, chemical space is, is quite straightforward uh, to be defined. Uh, so I've written here the single particle shooting equation uh, as it's uh, typically done within the cohen sham density functional theory. Uh, your Hamiltonian defines your system and then for one um, non-interacting particle, so it, it gets only through the mean um, the, the presence of the other electrons, you, you have to solve this equation. Um, now, uh, where does your system enter? Um, through the Cohn-Sharm potential, um, you have the, the famous um, exchange correlation potential, which you have to approximate. Um, there's the Hartree potential, and in the external potential, the nuclear charges and um, the, the, the poles, the, the position in real space are recorded. And this determines then the electronic solution um, to your problem. Um, so um, in other words, chemical space is uh, of the dimensionality, the former dimensionality of 4n plus 1, uh, n being the number of uh, atoms. You have three coordinates, x, y, z in real space, plus um, the nuclear charge, which uh, determines which element uh, you're looking at. Um, and then you have uh, electronic degrees of freedom, so number of electrons or spin states or so um, all, all this is lumped in, into this one. Um, so um, uh, your number of atoms can easily range uh, uh, up to a million atoms if you think of proteins and other molecular moieties of larger size. Um, that's no problem. Um, and so then you, you realize how, how bad uh, the problem is, right? But um, in, in terms of definition, uh, mathematically speaking, it's very well defined. Um, and so you can think of a high dimensional coordinate and nuclear charge space. And for instance, then the N2 molecule would be, would be just one point. And um, you can actually move along the space, right? And here you see the electronic energy. So the, the eigenvalue solution uh, within some approximation as a function of changes in nuclear um, nuclear charges as well as uh, function in, in geometry and so uh, it's much more common for us to look at changes in geometry but uh, shooting as equation can also be solved for um, uh, non-integer nuclear charges uh, we call that alchemical um, uh, mutations because of course there's no experiment in, in reality that, that would um, correspond to such a change um, so in other work in my group, we um, actually tailor expand using perturbation theory. We, we tailor expand on such a smooth surface and that works very well. So if you perturb uh, the N2 molecule here to um, up to fourth order, you can reconstruct the um, electron densities of CO or BF uh, from 
uh, what you, you obtain for entry. So, so um, these results and, and this illustration hopefully um, uh, convinces you that it uh, makes a lot of sense to, to build uh, an interpolating regressor in, in such a space. Now, um, this is a, a recast version of a figure that was shown uh, already before by, by Frank Noe. The, the, uh, he called it the figure of pain. Um, so it, it shows the error of your quantum method as a function of uh, CPU time. And uh, it's, it's, he, he put the, the number of electrons here. I, I just put directly how, how long you'd have to wait. Now, uh, obviously, that will change as, as computers become faster. So please don't quote me on, on these numbers. And also, the accuracies here might change depending on your system. So it's just to give you a rough idea. Um, all these um, uh, acronyms on the diagonal represent quantum chemistry methods, like um, semi-empirical quantum chemistry, hardwick fog mean field, perturbation theory, quantum Monte Carlo, and FFR force fields, right? And so, so you can uh, very quickly get results with force fields, but unfortunately, they're not, not very accurate. Now, if you um, uh, find a sweet spot here, also this was uh, pointed out by Frank already, you might very well get the Nobel Prize uh, as it happened for density functional theory. Now, what we'd like to do is to um, uh, invest to do the expensive stuff, uh, uh, but uh, now we don't uh, put CPU time here, but the number of training molecules, right? And um, so uh, if, if you train uh, like this, uh, your error, your prediction error, should uh, uh, decay linearly on a log-log scale. Uh, this was shown uh, by, by Wapnick and others um, for, for kernel methods, as well as by Müller and for neural nets. Um, and uh, once you train your model, right, uh, then you harvest the, the speed, of course, of, of your machine learning model. And you, you can get an accurate predictions within milliseconds. And that's really what um, the entire field of computational chemistry um, is, is really excited about. And um, this is, uh, I don't want to brag, but this field is, is very large, right? So, so um, uh, in 2014, Nature um, had a paper on the most cited uh, studies in, in human history. And DFT, so uh, atomistic simulation, uh, was, was, had two papers in the top 10 papers of, of all of scientific humanity. So you can imagine that, that this community is actually um, very considerable. Um, <clears throat> now, what, what we see is that the um, error on these log-log curves um, uh, must decay linearly. And, and if you do this, uh, of course, you wonder, um, given some uh, budget for your training data, um, how can you make this uh, curve uh, come down so be more data efficient um, and not only um, decrease the offset, but also maybe improve on the slope, right? And so a lot of our work has, has been um, dealing with, with this question, with this goal of uh, improving uh, the model such that uh, the learning curves uh, improve. Uh, so we, we use these learning curves as, as measures of of quality and uh, this is really uh, what helps us a lot also to compare the, between different models. Um, so um, Alex uh, mentioned before and, uh, uh, and also before Gabo and, and Michele uh, brought this up, um, these learning curves on the QM9 data set, which we published in 2014. Um, and uh, these are atomization energies that are being predicted as a function of training set. Uh, our first representation, the Coulomb matrix, which we published in 2012, uh, performs like this. And you should know that uh, this 0 0.06 EV roughly, this is where um, uh, you would uh, reach a level of predictive power that is on par with uh, experimental uncertainties. So, it doesn't make much sense to go beyond that. But uh, as you can see with the Coulomb matrix, we would have needed uh, tens of millions of training instances. So uh, very expensive. Uh, now with this uh, Bob representation, Alex mentioned uh, things improved already, but of course we, we would like to, to go much better. So one question was, how can we improve these representations? Um, and of course you can uh, use a neural net to, to uh, train them, uh, to learn them. Um, 
but uh, we, we also wanted to better understand what, what really happens. Um, and so um, uh, what you see here now is a, a simple experiment where we use the Coulomb matrix, which contains simply the inverse distances with an exponent n here. And uh, the, the origin of the Coulomb matrix, so here you see the, the Coulomb decay, is uh, the, the idea of the original idea of the Coulomb matrix was that we wanted something physical. So as atoms dissociate in a molecule, their, their contribution to the representation should decay since they interact less. Uh, so the reasoning was as simple as that. Um, and now, of course, if the interaction increases with the distance, uh, things would be less physical. And uh, so here you see the experiment where we tested that if uh, having a less physical representation actually leads to uh, worse uh, machine learning models. And indeed, you see, if we put uh, here for n equals minus one, uh, so just linearly growing um, in the representation, your learning curve uh, moves upward. Uh, and also quadratically, things get even worse. So of course, you can uh, turn this around and empirically test, and we converge towards an exponent of of r to the minus six, uh, reminiscent of, of London dispersion law. Um, and so it's something very physical in, in that sense. And so um, we thought including physics as such through such power laws would really improve things. Um, so um, there were many developments and I, I believe Michele Ciaiotti also talked about this, but um, I just want to briefly sketch out our latest representation. It's called the FCHL representation after Faber uh, at all, uh, Felix Faber was a postdoc, a PhD student in my lab. He's a postdoc now with uh, Alpha Lee in Cambridge. Um, and um, the FCHL acronym comes uh, from uh, simply using the first letters of the last names of the authors. Um, it contains uh, radio distribution functions of distances, angles, uh, dihedras, etc., uh, using just Gaussians. Um, and it also combines uh, these power laws so that we have the right physical behavior. Such a simple uh, representation where, where distances can be obtained analytically uh, then resulted in this black uh, line. And, and so this is one of the, the most performing uh, representations we have right now. Um, you see other representations, the SOAP representation uh, by, by Gabor and uh, Bartok. Um, uh, and some uh, the, the deep tensor neural network Alexander was uh, as mentioned, um, you see them as well. Um, now, now why does uh, this FCHL work so well? Uh, one reason to, or one way also to analyze this is uh, by looking at um, the principal component analysis and the dimensions uh, of uh, a kernel. Um, and if you um, use uh, the Coulomb matrix as a representation, the first two dimensions, they, they look like this. Um, with the Bob representation, things are already a, li a little bit better, but you still see some superposition indicating that a much higher dimensionality is, is, uh, is at place here. Um, and with the FCHL though, you, you can see a much, much smoother monotonic distribution in just two dimensions suggesting that, that the linear regression in the, in the nonlinear kernel space, uh, feature space is, is uh, much, uh, much easier, right? And, and so that uh, could explain uh, from the machine learning side of view why um, this, um, uh, this uh, representation is so much better. Uh, this is the latest snapshot. Uh, many other groups have, have joined and, and you see points all over, neural nets, uh, active learning. It's, it's all over the place, but um, FCHL is still uh, doing very well. Um, we, we sort of had the impression that the field saturated and, and there was not much more progress on this. And so um, uh, two years ago, we, we announced this challenge. Um, so for anybody who uh, gets a machine learning model that hits this uh, dot here, uh, these professors on the list, they agreed to each pay a hundred bucks. So. Um, I don't know if money is an incentive, uh, social sciences claim it is. Um, but uh, of course, it would uh, scientifically be uh, much more interesting to uh, better understand what, uh, how, how a machine learning model could, could reach such uh, data efficiency. Uh, now, let me uh, tell you another story of uh, how we managed to uh, improve on, on the offset here. Um, 
in 2017 with uh, researchers from Google, we, we uh, published sort of an overview on the QM9 data sets of various uh, machine learning models. And you see a snapshot here. These are learning curves. Uh, each line is a different machine learning model. And uh, Alex also pointed this out, intensive properties that are more tricky than extensive properties. And this is something you see here, for instance, for the dipole moment. There's only one neural net that gets to an accuracy denoted here by this black solid line, which would be desirable. Um, and uh, this neural net, uh, also this neural net needs more than 100,000 training instances. Uh, kernel methods and all other methods here are, are really um, uh, not satisfying at all. And, and so um, we really wondered what, what we can do to um, improve on this. And, and um, so the way we treated these dipole moments was simply as a label uh, for each molecule, just the same way as we did for the energy. But in fact, of course, there's a differential relationship between the energy and these uh, dipole moments. Uh, so the, the dipole moments is the first order derivative of the energy with respect to the field. And in our learning, we, we had a no ways uh, accounted for that. Um, and so uh, in this paper, we, we explored uh, this idea. So you assume your energy um, is approximated by this uh, kernel expression. Then you can write um, uh, any response property of, of your energy as a response of uh, your kernel approximation. And uh, so this alters then the loss function you're using and you can write this out and solve for the regression coefficients within kernel rich regression. And um, for uh, the first uh, order derivatives uh, in, let's see, in uh, Let's say in a vector, so x, y, c, uh, you would get this expression and uh, you can do this also for second order derivatives and so on. And so your, your loss function adapts to the differential relationships among um, these properties. And um, when we do this, uh, you uh, see a dramatic improvement. So what uh, we show here is a toy model. Um, this is the energy as a function of the angle uh, of an electric field applied to hydrogen fluoride. So you see the angle orientation also indicated by this arrow here. If you uh, simply learn with this one training point, uh, you, you just use it as a label, your machine predicts uh, throughout uh, this curve, of course, the same value. Um, if you include this gradient at this point, uh, the, uh, the prediction from, uh, the, um, from the reference is uh, hardly distinguishable. Um, so uh, you see there's a lot of improvement and uh, we revisited our molecules in QM9 and sure enough, the dipole moment predictions improved uh, in offset and slope uh, dramatically. Now, uh, of course, there are other uh, interesting differential relationships um, in the atomistic simulation sciences and uh, maybe the most important one are atomic forces and, and Hessians and so of course we also wanted to look at that. And here you see now the energy as a function of interatomic distance in hydrogen fluoride. And um, without training, uh, without forces, your, your machine would uh, interpolate as shown by this dotted line. Um, and once you impose uh, the right uh, loss function, you, you get a much better uh, uh, prediction. Um, now uh, we, we um, looked at this also for uh, molecules and uh, to, to test uh, forces throughout chemical space is much more tricky. There are much less uh, data sets for that. Uh, but we use here the ISO 17 um, data sets. So these are MD trajectories on 17 different um, constitutional isomers. Um, and uh, if you include the constitutional isomer in question in the data, then you get the green line. So you make life much easier. If you exclude the, um, the isomer in question from your training data and you, you try to do a brand new prediction of a new molecule, you get the red curve and uh, you see that uh, we get very uh, good learning curves. And uh, you see here, for, just for comparison, the Schnett performance on, on these data sets is, is very similar. So these are not our um, uh, predictions, but uh, from uh, Alex uh, and, and Klaus Müller's group. Um, we also looked at um, uh, different molecules in the MD17 data set. Alex mentioned the, the GDML model um, and the Schnett here. And you see that this uh, response FCHL is actually uh, uh, typically outperforms uh, the other two, uh, except for, for uh, a 
few cases. Um, <clears throat> we uh, recently made this representation uh, much faster by discretizing it and exploiting uh, Fourier series. And uh, we can now, um, because of that, do a better hyperparameter optimization and we get even better uh, learning curves uh, for forces and energies. And we can also look at the timing. So these are training timings and CPU uh, core seconds. Um, and this is the number of atoms in this, uh, in this uh, data set. And you see with the, with the latest, the FCHL19, uh, you see our training times uh, are an order of magnitude faster on, on average. Um, now I'd like to um, come to another example of uh, how we improved uh, the offset, and in particular, um, the model chemistry of John Popel, uh, for which he also got, uh, shared the Nobel Prize with, with, uh, uh, with Walter Kohn. Um, this model chemistry combines uh, different levels of theory uh, in advantageous ways such that you can uh, fairly inexpensively estimate um, the predictions of, of the most expensive uh, uh, quantum chemistry um, uh, approximation, namely a very large basis set uh, with full electron correlation treatment. Um, so we wanted to mimic this within machine learning and we teamed up with mathematicians at the University of Basel, Peter Suswell and uh, Helmut Habrich. And we use the multi-level sparse grid combination technique uh, in combination with uh, machine learning and, and chemical space. So uh, you basically have to define uh, certain dimensions and in each dimension you have different levels. And this is shown here, the dimension is basis set. Uh, the second dimension is electron correlation treatment and the third dimension is a chemical compound space. And uh, the, the final machine learning model is really a recursive model which goes from one um, level combination to another one. So you walk through this uh, combination, uh, through, through the space of, of possible levels and, and dimensions, and um, you can save then in terms of having to invest in, in the most expensive training data points which, which you have to use. And so we, we show this first now by fixing um, one level of the basis set. So we explore different electron correlation and different training set sizes. And you see that here, the, most, the number of the most expensive calculations is shown here. In black, you see the, the, um, uh, the, the usual, the conventional uh, machine learning model. So if you just do direct learning of the highest level, and then you see, depending on how you, uh, how you choose the ratio between your training set sizes. We investigated two ratios uh, denoted here by S equals one or two. Um, you uh, see an improvement in the offset, right? And uh, the best improvement you find for the most aggressive ratio here uh, and for including all the three levels in the electron correlation treatment. So you, you see that you can uh, reach chemical accuracy. That's uh, roughly one K per mole you can reach chemical accuracy a thousand times faster. Um, and then of course we did this for the full 3D thing. And also here you see fast improvement shown here in red. We didn't go to chemical accuracy here for the simple reason that we didn't have enough of the cheapest uh, training instances in our data set. So that's why we stopped uh, right now. We are, we are trying to uh, improve on that. Now, um, I'd also like to tell you briefly about um, the, the uh, study which was mentioned before with the Amens. Uh, this was work done by my postdoc Ping Wang. Um, and the idea is that if you have a large query molecule, um, uh, in, in naively. Anatole, you, Anatole, may I just say you are, you are running in the discussion session? You have still oh, sorry. five minutes. I leave it to you, but uh, just to give you a, an update. Okay. Maybe people can post their questions in the chat and, and then uh, while, while I still try to wrap up this paper, okay? Sure. Um, so uh, naively you would uh, compare um, this compound, your query compound to training compounds of similar size, right? Uh, that are somehow similar. But uh, we looked at this question, what if you compared the atoms in your training compound to um, atoms in your query compound. And if you do that, uh, you can actually choose your, your number of atoms in the, in the training molecule to be much smaller than in your query, right? And if, if you do that, you exploit the locality of the comparison in order 
to build models for, for much larger systems. Um, so for instance, if you wanted to get the effect of, of this OH group, you could use water and then methanol and then ethanol and so on. And as you increase the, the environment around your local comparison, you would expect this model to converge. Um, and so this is something which uh, we think of as, as a dictionary, right? Uh, so if your, if your sentence is, is the entire compound and the effect is, is some property, um, then the atoms would be your letters and these amens are, are the words. So we can make a dictionary of those. Now, uh, here's an example. Take this molecule, you search for all the subgraphs and um, these are all the subgraphs in this molecule. So if you have a dictionary that contains them, you can predict um, the properties of these molecules. And you see here the error as a function of the number of, of these dictionary entries. And uh, you see it very rapidly becomes very fast. Um, uh, very accurate. Um, and here you see an average of 10,000 molecules. You see the uh, arrows uh, coming down very rapidly. Now we approach chemical accuracy at less than 100 training instances on average. Now note that this is very different from what I showed before, because these are not the same training molecules for every query, right? So these are query specific uh, models that were trained on the fly, but because the training set is so specific, it's very small and the training is uh, also very fast. Um, so what this actually means is that we improved on the slope in uh, this machine learning approach. So when conventionally we had this before, I showed this, we now have uh, something like this with the amens and you see in, in black, it's a much steeper slope. I'd like to um, now jump to the end. We have more results, but maybe it's more interesting to, to see the discussion. Um, let me uh, simply jump ahead. Um, I'd like to briefly mention that um, we have uh, what we call the QML code. It's on the GitHub. Uh, please uh, join this effort if you're interested. I'd also like to mention that um, we, the Institute of Physics uh, established a journal for machine learning and science and technology. So when, when your work is not really about uh, developing the pure math, but rather applying machine learning or developing models that, that can be applied, then uh, please consider submitting your work here. And um, finally, I'd like to mention also that we just recently uh, had a book come out in lecture notes in physics with many, many important contributions. Um, I have to thank uh, the people who did the work, Bing Wang and, uh, and Anders Christensen and also Felix Faber um, and uh, Heine, uh, Steffen Heinen for all their work. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, thank you so much for this very interesting talk. Uh, there is still time for a few questions. So please go ahead and indicate that you have a question in the chat. Maybe I can make a start with an easy question. At the beginning of your talk, you uh, you just reviewed, you know, this general scheme, QC, CQ, and so on, and you made a comment about the QQ scheme that that would be the most interesting one. I'm not quite sure whether I understood that correctly, but my question would be, what would it exactly be, this QQ scheme, in in the context of uh, quantum chemistry? Do you, do you imagine a quantum computer operating on molecules? And what, what is it exactly that you have in mind there? Yes, so, so if, your, um, if, if your machine learning algorithm is, is a quantum algorithm, you, you could um, more efficiently do the training on quantum properties of uh, of compounds, right? So um, that that is uh, what what I think we, we should uh, one could expect um, as as a first um, as a first sort of uh, step in this direction. I, I think uh, much more can be done there, but uh, that that I think. Uh, in fact, I, I have a collaboration with Maria Schuld where, where we uh, exactly try to do that together. But uh, 
of course, a quantum computer or a, any device that runs a quantum algorithm would need the data in quantum form. So you would need to provide, so to speak, the input should be a quantum mechanical state. And that's not so clear to me how you would do that. So I think it, it, it that's wouldn't- That's what I understand on the QQ scenario that it yeah. directly operates. Yeah, in. and this first step, I don't think it would be any different from, um, from the CQ. So they, where you do a, so to the quantum computer, the data could look classical. It doesn't need to know that uh, it's quantum at its origin. But then, of course, uh, it would be interesting to see then if, if there's a difference and how it looks like. Okay, so there's another question in the meantime from Peter asking, can you provide the GitHub link you mentioned? You have a request. I just pasted that. Okay. Any more questions, comments? So if, if not, I would encourage you just to, uh, to, you can still use the chat room, of course. Uh, otherwise, yes, here is the link. Thanks a lot. Um, yes, uh, if there is no further question, then we, we will continue the afternoon session at four. And uh, so this, this closes this session and let me take the opportunity to thank again uh, Anatol for this great talk and all the speakers of this afternoon session and see you back at thank the you.